What up, fam? I am Dr. De Luna, and you are listening to Drop It Like It's Doc podcast. Today we have on Nikki Ray Bose, who I am blessed to call one of my best friends. But really, she is such an important member of the San Diego community, not only because she is a phenomenal yoga instructor, but she's the owner of Reunify Yoga, a studio that has weaved into its consciousness this feeling of inclusivity and unity. Today, this conversation, first off, goes into some hilarious stories from my past, but we talk all about what it's like being a human doing this damn thing called life. The highs, the lows, the times where you feel like you're swimming in a soup full of mud, If you feel like you're going through a hard time and like you are just being swished around in the ocean without an end in sight, this episode is for you, okay? So listen with a friend that needs it or, you know, yourself, cry yourself to sleep. It's going to be great. We're in it together, okay? Thanks for being here. Hi, Nikki. Hi, Ashley. (laughs) (laughs) I am so happy to have you on all to myself because the first time you were on was our number one ranking episode, (laughs) Bondas and Buttholes, you and John Beck. But let's be real. He's a princess. We love our princess, but he overpowers the space. So I'm really happy (laughs) to have just you on because you are brilliant and I adore you. Mm, thank you. He's a performer, though. And we love a good performance. Yeah. I mean, I'm a performer, so that's probably why we just compete the whole time. That's true. And why I annoy the shit out of him. But I won't perform today. And I don't think I did this the first time that you were on because both of you were on. And I think I just love bomb both of you. But now you get to receive so much love from my heart onto you. <laughs> Miss Nikki. I remember meeting you at Indie Yoga, and I just remember being in awe of your power and your presence, and I was intimidated by you because your energy is so strong, and once I finally got into your little heart space, once I wiggled through and made myself (laughs) in there and got nice and comfy, you are one of the most loving people I've ever met. You are so... One of my favorite things about you is that you can understand what everyone is going through in such an empathetic way. And you have taught me a lot about forgiveness. You forgive in a way that I have yet to be able to do. Honestly, (laughs) you have held me in some of the darkest moments of my life with so much love, so much compassion. You have never judged me for any of the unbelievable fucking things that come out of my mouth or the things that my mind connects. You will just lovingly hold the space for me. And, but also you will with love kind of slap me back into reality, which as a friend, I so badly need. And that's just more of what the world needs. You own and have created your firstborn before Sweet Remy. Such a haven for my life. Reunify Yoga is such a gift to my life, to the community, to San Diego at large. That space as kind of a offshooting of you has held me through so many times. And I think that, you know, and a lot of what this episode is going to be talking about has been the unbelievable transitions that we have both been through. And in so many dark times of my life in which I hated myself, knowing that someone as beautiful as you loved me and I'm going to cry, like truly it it made me just love myself more Mm. because I value you and kind of your moral compass and the fact that you could love me through those hard times helped me just be more compassionate and gentle with myself. So there's not even close to enough words that can express just how grateful I am for you. So thank you for existing. Wow. Mm -hmm. Can I just like sit here for an hour and like really integrate that instead of talking? Yes. (laughs) Yes, you can. I can keep going. I just had to hold in because, you know, I couldn't cry though. But yeah, you are a queen, Nikki. Thank you for that. You're welcome. (laughs) Thank you for everything. (laughs) So as I kind of alluded to, this episode, we're going to talk just about the real shit that humans go through Mm -hmm. and how that can either dig you into a hole of misery or how it can project you into the evolution to become the human that you've always meant to be. And speaking of that, I would love to learn more, and I know my listeners would, about how you ended up being you where you started (laughs) how you got here because you're not from here i am not from here i'm from chicago yeah yeah and i moved here when i turned 18 Mm. i moved here to go to ucsd in order to 
um, one, cultivate a relationship with my father who I didn't grow up with. And he lived in LA and that was like a big intention of mine. I was like, okay, I want to really, you know, make amends and pour energy into something that there's not a lot of, um, there was just, wasn't a lot there. Let's yeah. just put it that way. And I also wanted to study molecular biology. No, I just lied. I did not want to study molecular <laughs> biology. I wanted to study pre-medicine. Mm, actually. What? I know. Really? I, I wanted to be a doctor until I met other people who wanted to be a doctor. And then I realized, oh, I don't want to be a doctor that bad <laughs> <laughs> because they were so vicious. And I think it was more just, I wanted to help people. Mm. So, um, yeah. And then I studied for a long time, became a, ended up being a clinical molecular biologist and was miserable doing that profession. <laughs> like just picture me in lab coat, booties, hairnet, totally sterile environment, going to work every day and working in the lab. At first I worked with tons of pipettes and then it was like robots. I hated it. <laughs> Did it for about five years. And basically I had such extreme anxiety. I would like pull up to the parking lot and sit in my car with such debilitating anxiety that I finally had to like listen to my heart's call, which was to quit my job. And I had already been teaching yoga at night. I did my yoga teacher training when I was 20 or 21 or something. So I had been doing like molecular biologist by day, yoga teacher by night. And it was just like, you know, like the more I practiced, the more in tune with my heart's message I was. And so like, I could not deny like the very difficult, but very necessary thing I had to do. Mm -hmm. which was like quit my job that like actually paid the bills and just go. And so I did that. And I, I went to go study in India and I traveled um, through Asia alone for, I think it was five months and did a ton of volunteering and, and eventually came back and started reunify. And wow, there's a whole bunch of facets of me that have developed since I opened reunify. Cause that has been incredibly humbling. And then there's the whole other stage of like new motherhood and then more humbling. It's all just the whole life thing is just so much humbling. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Continuously yeah. humbled yeah, by it's life. Like, it's like, okay, not listening to my intuitive knowing, not listening to my intuitive knowing. And then life just like gives you more and more and more beatings for lack of a better word, or like more yeah. wake up calls until you finally do it. And then it's expansion. And I just feel like my whole life has been this dance of that. Mm. What a beautiful visualization too. Mm. And even, you know, I have memories of us because we would both, we would leave Ocean Beach and I would drive to medical school up the five and you would drive to La Jolla on the five. And we would, you know, sometimes I would see you in the car driving there. And I just remember always being like, Nikki's going to the lab, fun. And that feeling of showing up somewhere and dread. How many people have that every single day when they go to work every single day? And the fact that you jumped out of something that was very financially lucrative. And, you know, something that I think also just being someone who went to school in the sciences, you know, your parents, your grandparents, they were probably like, Nikki, what are you doing? What are you doing? How could you do this? You're stupid. You're going to be a yoga teacher. And you followed your heart and look where that led you. I know it's crazy. A lot of people thought I was nuts. Cause like there's so many yoga teachers and everyone has their YTT in San Diego. Mm -hmm. So many yoga <laughs> studios. So it was like, it really sounded like the crazy thing to do, but I, I just knew I had to do it. Yeah. yeah. And when I wanted to open up, I didn't even know I wanted to open up a yoga studio eventually, but then I realized I wanted to create community mm. and that was, I realized that was one of my highest values. And so that required me to open up a yoga studio. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not being a sterile lab. Yeah. No. I think, <laughs> I think community and I still create a community in that lab because yeah. it's just my tendency. It's my natural tendency. I was like, a coffee break therapist. Yeah. Um, I really was. I was not surprised. <laughs> I'd be like, meet me in the coffee room. Let's talk about your uh, marriage issues. <laughs> and uh, then I would guide little meditations out on like the cement slab outside of the building. But um, yeah, uh, side tangent. So I think community is something that we really need as humans, especially mm -hmm. through life's ups and downs. Because like, as you were saying in the love bomb, you felt that I was able to hold you through the darkest versions of yourself. And when we have that reflection for ourselves, which is often within community, we begin to learn how to love those darkest versions of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that is like, dude, that's the work work. Yeah. And that's something that whether you're aware of it or not, but I think you are aware of it, you have weaved into the consciousness of your studio. Mm -hmm. And like you said, everyone in San Diego has their YTT, even Southern California, you know, you could there's yoga studios everywhere and every studio has its own vibe. And your studio has this feeling of, hi, I will hold you as you are. Come, 
you are welcome here. And I don't think that a lot of places have that vibe. And also just as a teacher, you know, you invite that into the space. I invite that into the space. I'm like, please do whatever you need to do. This is your space. And I always tell my students, like, I've sobbed in this room before. (laughs) Do you need to sob? Mm -hmm. Let the tears fill the floors. Mm -hmm. They will hold you. Yeah. (sighs) A lot of people need permission to feel Mm -hmm. that way because I would say like our our culture, our society doesn't give us those permissions. No. So I'm constantly doing that when I'm teaching. And Mm -hmm. also in my friendships and relationships, I'm constantly being giving permission for people to feel anger, sadness, all the things. But of course I list the negative emotions first because I think those ones are harder Mm -hmm. to feel. And I am blessed to experience a lot of those. I don't think people see that as a blessing, but now at this point in my life, I do because it makes it really easy to relate to people. Mm. And also um, it makes it a lot easier to hold that container for other people when they're feeling it. Cause I'm like, oh, I've been there. Yeah. You're not like, oh no, don't cry. Don't feel angry. It's none of that. It's like, oh yeah, I see you. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite things that happened in our friend group when I was going through my explosion of life that I've spoken to on this podcast a few times. So, you know, we could talk about it again. Um, was actually something that our friend Shay said, I was on a walk with her and I just remember venting and saying all these things. And I was used to people being like, you know, I was going through a divorce. People were like, it's okay. Or have you thought about marriage counseling? Like all these like band-aid, like pats on the back, like you're going to be okay. And instead she just looked at me and she's like, fuck, it's a (laughs) lot. That's a lot. And it was a lot. And all I wanted was someone to acknowledge, like, that's a lot. You're going through it. Mm -hmm. How can I support you? Or can I just listen? But so many people want to fix. Yeah. I think that is a major issue. And I think a lot of the things that are times of darkness or times of challenge are the things we need to face rather than fix. Mm -hmm. And part of yoga and part of the philosophies of yoga teach us how to face those things teach us how to sit in discomfort. Mm -hmm. And it's through those situations, like in my YTTs, I call it triggers are the golden key. It's like through those triggers, those situations, those big moments of challenge, we really begin to discover who we are. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, what our values are. Yeah. And I love how even you said, I've been blessed to experience many negative emotions because Even from a physiological standpoint, I work with so many people that cushion their emotions. You ask them how they are and they say, fine, or I'm good. And it won't be until their spouse is in the room who can highlight like, hey, babe, why aren't you telling her about what you told me about yesterday? And I'm Mm -hmm. their doctor. I'm there to help them. And something that I see a lot just for listeners and, you know, we're going to connect the dots between the energetics and everything. But for people that cushion their emotions, oftentimes I find that that develops into fatty liver, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, because your liver, and I'm not a TCM practitioner, but my listeners, I know you watched the Nalu episode and the liver is the holding place of anger. It stores it. And so many people won't let themselves feel angry. You could feel them boiling in their body and they won't let themselves feel angry. And then they cushion that emotion and it tells their cells how to respond to that situation. And then their cells cushion themselves. And now their liver is filled with fat and they don't know how that happened. And it's not based on their diet. It's not based on their lifestyle. It's based on that emotional piece. So, yeah. I always think about emotions as energy in motion. Mm -hmm. And if there's any stifling of them, I'm not a doctor in any way, chose the non-pre-med route. (laughs) Um, And if there's any, I always visualize this and I don't know, you know, sometimes we just have those like visual understandings that come to us, like Mm -hmm. through like being in our bodies. Like I always visualize when we're stifling emotions or holding them in and like emotions, you feel them physically. Like if I have anxiety, I feel it on my chest. And a Mm -hmm. lot of times I have to move my body to move it through me or like write a journal entry or whatever, call my best friend. And I, I do picture that those like dense pockets of energy creating illness or yeah. like dis-ease. Um, not that I know that that's a fact, but it's just something that seems to make sense in my mind. It does make sense. And not only do you, you, you also teach yin and you drop into the connective tissue and the fascia. And that is such a mind body, all of yoga practices, of course, but yin is so juicy in that sense, because I think that you can really find those pockets. Oh yeah. And that's why, you know, for the listeners that have never understood why, you know, you're in a forward fold or opening your hips and you feel like you're going to cry. And I describe this in teacher trainings because you are incredibly intuitive and that is what happens when you have an emotion. 
It is such a strong sensory input to your brain. It goes through the back of the brain. So basically our brain, which I call the walnut, (laughs) the back of the brain is where most of the sensory input comes in and sensations are designed to create an action, a motor output. That could be a movement. It could be, you know, and anything to get that sensory input to have its intended shift. And so many people do not have that happen. They just feel, they just feel, they just feel, but they don't let themselves have a motor output. That could be having a conversation about whatever it is that's coming up. It could be moving your body. It could be, you know, and it could be as simple as being like, I'm really hungry. I need to eat. But people, when they don't allow that to happen, the energy does stay in the body and the sensory input because it's trying to create a motor output, the motor system is in the muscles and the muscles are surrounded by fascia. So the fascia holds the imprint of what that muscle was being asked to do. Mm. And fascia is something that I work into in craniosacral and in yin and really any movement practice, you're not just moving one part of your body. Of course, you're integrating the fascia, but to kind of connect that intuitive thing that you felt with something very scientific, it does stick in your body, it holds. And that's why when you drop in, Sometimes a memory could come up or a really strong emotion. And I've had the fucking wildest things come up in yin before, like feeling like my heart was getting stabbed. And I'm like, okay, am I going to freak out? Am I going to ruin this whole class Mm. and call an ambulance? Or am I going to breathe through this? (laughs) That happened a few weeks ago. Yeah. 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 Big time memories can come up. Mm -hmm. um, Teaching in, practicing in, all of the things. And I think, you know, in our childhood, we don't necessarily had, we didn't have all the tools we have now. And even through the teenage years when a lot was felt then. So, so much of our past, we didn't really feel. We're just like, all right, going to shove that down. All right, going to dissociate from that. Mm -hmm. And so when we show up to the mat, those things that we dissociated from or shoved deep down in will arise. And so even those difficult moments, those transitions that we chose not to face, they a lot of times come up in the practice, Mm -hmm. even if it's just like a physical signal. Oh yeah. (laughs) They come up all right. And I love that you said, you know, if you left your body, because I think that that is for me, that was, I mean, there's a few pieces of my yoga journey that has completely transformed my mental health. But one was actually just being in this. I don't think I was in here for a really long time. Mm -hmm. I remember when I first felt my feet ground in a yoga class, like actually connect. And I was like, wow. And I didn't know this until I was getting a massage and She was feeling into my legs. She's like, your legs are really tight. I'm like, oh, I don't even really feel that. I don't feel my legs. Huh, normal. So the fact that you are in a room with other individuals and you are going through this step-by-step journey that the teacher is guiding you on into your body, you have to be there. Of course, you know, there's been dozens of yoga classes that I've left, but the teacher's intention is to kind of pull you back in and to say different keywords to different parts of your body, but also the breath, because maybe that's the most powerful thing of that whole practice. It's just teaching you how to breathe because in breathing, then you could sit with yourself in those moments where otherwise, I don't think people recognize that when you hold your breath, your mind will pull you out of your body because it's perceiving that you're having something dangerous occur to you. So breathing, when you're in a class with other people where, you know, you can't necessarily lean on the things that you would do to dissociate. You can't scroll on your phone. You can't, you know, smoke. You can't. An entire bar of chocolate. Yeah, exactly. Yes. (laughs) We've all been there. I love chocolate. Yeah. Yeah. So Mm, the gift that keeps on giving. Yes. And I, and I, I tell students and I try to tell myself this, like when you're in a moment of discomfort, like when I'm teaching dragon pose in a yin class or, you know, like holding warrior two for like a ridiculous amount of time in a hatha, like I tell them, okay, turn to the breath, like show your body, like I can be centered in discomfort. Mm -hmm. I'm with the hopes that when a moment arises in everyday life, that's uncomfortable rather than eating a bar of chocolate really quick, or even just getting reactive. Mm -hmm. You can like pause, take the deep breaths and get curious about what's there. Like, why is this uncomfortable? Why is this creating like a feeling of divisiveness or separation in me? Mm -hmm. You know, because ultimately all of those moments are showing you where you're still holding on or some of the illusions that you're still holding on to. And Mm -hmm. that's really heady philosophy stuff, but yeah. It's so true though. I was the most reactive fire queen ever. People called me Smashly because I would just throw shit. Like if it triggered me enough, that was my motor output. Like the input of incredible sensation that was usually anxiety 
and anger. I'm really good at being angry. It would just build up in my body and I wouldn't know how to have a healthy release other than truly picking up something and throwing it against a wall. Like I have memories of my ex watching me. <laughs> Poor man. Like, honestly, I say that a lot on this podcast. I'm like, fuck, did I put him through a lot? But I had this gallon jug of water. That was like my water that I would refill at the water store. And I picked it up and I saw that he saw that I picked it up and it was like, oh no, she's going to fucking throw it. And I went to throw it against the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and this huge man, I'm going to cry again because it's so funny. This is laughing tears though. He jumped his body in front of the water and like bounced off of his chest and hit the bed. But like, yeah. Was I mean, it glass? It was fucking glass. It was oh. a glass gallon jug. Yeah. Oh, I know. My, yeah, strong that? belly, strong belly. Wow, <laughs> that's nice. Yeah, I'm crazy. But at least you weren't so, holding it in. I do. <laughs> and now we got to talk about that middle way. <laughs> yeah, now we'll talk about the center. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> listeners that also watched my Mindy episode, you know that she taught me to throw things right. So it took a lot of unraveling of my subconscious to not do that. Mm. But I also never want my listeners to think that I am perfect. You're not perfect. We practice these things every single day single day. Totally. And a lot of times fail. Absolutely. <laughs> a lot of times fail. Probably 80% of the time. Yeah. That's a key. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so my girl, you've definitely had some beautiful life experiences that maybe at the moment you would not have thought was a beautiful life experience. So I would love if we could just dip our toe into something that has entered your life that has shaped you into this mindful human that you are today. Mm. Dang, there's so many. Mm -hmm. I would say that uh, since I opened up, you know, I didn't really like think about what it means to run a business. And yeah. actually, I think a lot of people don't really realize how difficult it is to run a business. No, we never <laughs> know and then we do it. <laughs> a business full of humans for humans. Mm. There's a lot of personality types, mm. a lot of personality types. And every single persona has its own triggers, its own things that like move through it, both positive and negative. And I think for me, one of the part, one of the hardest parts of like running a business that is a community and like a full staff of humans. And by the way, um, for those of you who don't know, anyone who finds a lot of people who are like yogis and find yoga, it's because we're a little, <laughs> we've been through some shit. Yeah. And so, yeah, myself included, there's like this whole living, breathing entity of people coming to heal in the space. And so I have had to learn how to open up my perspective and get curious about like what certain emotions mean, what certain statements mean, rather than immediately taking things personally. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm very grateful for that because it has given me this opportunity to really practice what I preach, which is unconditional love, instead of immediately feeling attacked by someone who has certain criticisms, criticisms of, of me or like says something to me I don't like, I, get, I drop in, on a good day, <laughs> if it's in alignment with my cycle, I drop in and I get curious, like, why was that person an asshole? <laughs> why did it feel like that person was that? Why do I feel personally attacked? Is mm -hmm. it something in me or is it something in them? Like, what are they going through? And luckily I know a lot of my staff. I know a lot of my students and I can broaden my perspective. And what that does, it cultivate, it cultivates a practice of compassion. Mm. And for me, that compassion for others has slowly been transforming into a compassion for myself. Mm -hmm. I wish it could be the other way around. Cause I do think that would be a lovely order of things to like have compassion for myself and then have that like bleed out into others. But yeah, I think running a, a business that is a community has helped me build up this well of compassion. And I do think compassion is in our nature, but I think when we're, when we're identified with the mind, which we are, um, compassion, compassion has to be a practice. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I think running a business has cultivated this compassion for me. Um, yeah. That's one of, one of the hardships that led to something beautiful, I'd say. Yeah. And that is beautiful. And you know, you're absolutely right that most people that are drawn to the practice of yoga, whether they're aware of it or not, it is because there's something that they want to heal from. And yeah. it's something that they, or that they want to discover within whether themselves. Whether physical or emotional yeah. or spiritual, yeah. it's like one of the layers. One of the layers, it, absolutely, any of those things. And with that, your shit is going to come up. Yeah. 
it, when you, I, I don't know why anyone thinks that the healing journey is going to be this like beautiful process of like saging yourself and holding crystals and like doing full moon ceremonies. That's not what it is. You, you enter the muck of your depths of your pain of your trauma. And when that does come up, I think a lot of what does come up as well is this victim mentality mm -hmm. because at first I think it's human nature to want to say, how could they do this to me? How could they? And take that and hold it mm -hmm. and let that be a wound that you hold. And this throw, happened and to me. throw a water jug over it. And slam a water <laughs> jug. I wish I knew what that was. It was probably nothing. I was also vegan at that time and fucking starving hungry. all the time. <laughs> so hungry all the time. So that was honestly, it just like, I could not regulate. But yeah, why? And when you learn that, you know, most things that people do actually has nothing to do with you. Yeah. Actually nothing to do with you at all. They don't even have the capacity a lot of the times and they being humans, myself being one of them, most of the times we're so caught up in our own fucking story that what we do has nothing to do with the other person. And in that space that you have of owning a yoga studio and having holding the space and being that caretaker in a lot of ways, I'm sure that that was a really fucking hard lesson, especially in teacher trainings too. That's, when you're doing all the shadow work and people wild. are just like throwing it and- It's wild. Yeah, yeah. How do you practice boundaries in that situation? Mm, I'm working on boundaries. Yeah. Boundaries is one of my things for this year. I mm. would say I have a, I am not great with boundaries because I want to just give everything to everyone. And, but luckily having my first child, which is not reunified, like my human child, right? Yeah. Uh, has taught me that I have to set boundaries. I now have a limited capacity where mm -hmm. before I probably did have a limited capacity, but I told myself, I have, my whole heart is reunified. I'll give everything to it. Now it's like I'm raising this human baby. <laughs> yes. Yes, you are. I, and I really, <laughs> he requires a lot of my attention, a lot of my love, a lot of my patience. Mm. And so I have to, you know, in this world where I'm identified with the mind, because technically like our true nature is boundless. And this is a big question I get in my YTTs because people are like, wait, if yoga is union and we're all one, like why boundaries? Boundaries don't make sense. And I'm like, boundaries make sense until they don't anymore. Mm -hmm. It's like, if you're identified with the mind, if you're identified, like this is me, Nikki Ray Bowes, you look in the mirror every day and you're like, that's me. And like, you do believe that even if philosophically, you know, something else, like you have to utilize boundaries until the point that you naturally shed them. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a point where you're like having awakening, like, oh, I'm one with all beings. And like, then you don't need boundaries. Um, like there's the story that goes like the Buddha basically had a disciple waiting outside of his door to drink some tea. And Buddha was sitting in meditation for an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. Disciple is sitting there waiting, waiting, waiting patiently, you know, being a holy man. <laughs> Finally, Buddha lets him in and says, all right, let's have some tea. Within five minutes, he wanted to ask his guru, basically, some questions. And a wild, crazy man runs in like evil, just screaming profanities at Buddha. And Buddha sets up a cushion, says, come, have tea with us. And this story shares like this concept of equanimity that might feel really far-fetched for us, but for the awakened one, which is what Buddha means, um, it's something that has arisen naturally. Mm -hmm. And the idea is we will get to that point if we commit to the practice, but when we're not there, like we have to set boundaries for ourselves, create an environment that allows for awakening. Because if we're constantly pouring into others and don't even have anything for ourselves, that awakening isn't gonna happen. Resentment's gonna arise, exhaustion, all of those things. Mm -hmm. So I would say for me, this year has been a lot about setting boundaries and and less people pleasing. Mm -hmm. I think of my concept of community and, and unconditional love, which like I hold at the utmost highest, sometimes has me um, denying some of the boundaries that I need to set. Yeah. Yeah. It's a continuous battle. It makes for a lot of difficult conversations. Yes, it does. And yeah. people hate difficult conversations, which yeah. is probably why people say yes to everything when they don't want to say yes. And then they're filled with resentment and anger. They don't let the anger out because they're trying to people please. And now they have fatty liver. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And you know why people <laughs> hate difficult conversations? I think yeah. about this all the time because um, when I dread difficult conversations, I have to have them all the time as a business owner, as mm -hmm. a friend to many, you know, mm -hmm. as a, as a lover, a mother, all the things. Um, I think people hate having difficult conversations because they're afraid to hurt someone else's ego. Mm -hmm. They don't want to shatter or break someone else's ego, which ultimately is just a reflection of their own. Mm -hmm. So it's really like them not wanting to let go of their own ego. Like they don't, they need to be loved. They need to be liked. And it's like, 
And yes. I say they, I mean I. I yeah. need to be loved. I need to be liked. And when I see that, I, I just see this like inner child work that's like, oh, baby Nick Nicks, you're liked, you're loved. Like you yeah. can have this hard conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. And I do think it definitely comes down to attachment styles because I can even see this in the relationship that I'm in now, which is the healthiest relationship I've ever been in. He was raised with two parents where at the end of every hard conversation, their underlying underlying understanding was we're talking about this so that we can come to a solution together and move forward. I did not come from that. Have you all met my mother? <laughs> so that was not it. It was, I am screaming at you. I am verbally assaulting you. I will leave you. I will leave you. And <laughs> until I'm right, until I am right. Mm -hmm. Like I will scream. I will, I will be right. Yeah. And she was, she always won. My parents are divorced. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was so for me, when I feel a bad or not bad, or just like a charged something that I need to say, and I am such a, I'm like a little tiny human with so much energy in here. It's unfucking believable. And when I have something I need to say, it eats me alive. I will not sleep. I will not be able to eat. I have to get it out of my body. And what comes up for me in those hard times is if I say this, will they leave me? Mm. And I have found that that has actually never happened once. Not once, especially if it's a conversation, you know, not taking Mindy's advice. You don't scream if it's a mindful conversation. And it's all about how you word things and the place that you're coming from. So if you're coming with it from, hey, I'm bringing this up because it's, this is how this is impacting me. And I want to see if we could come to a solution versus you are doing this wrong. You are wrong. You have to fix this. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, especially in this day and age, try to make the other person wrong. Totally. And this is just like, for me and my brain is just a direct metaphor, a direct reflection of like what we do when we face difficult situations in life. Just the same way, like that is a difficult conversation. It's like you and another person in a difficult situation in life. It's like you and life. Mm -hmm. And rather than saying like, okay, life, I'm going to like soften into this and like see what co-creation we're, we're making happen here. Instead, it's a ton of resistance. Like, mm -hmm. no, I don't want this. This is not for me. This is not how I envisioned it. And it's like a screaming argument, although inside your mind or inside your body, rather than this like, okay, softening into what is, what can I control and what can't I control? Mm -hmm. And so it's just a lot of the same thing in different circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. This kind of uh, deep breath and surrender that we need to do or need to take in order to really know like the heart's next move, the mm. heart's next action, um, rather than moving from the reactivity of the mind, which is what we're used to doing. It is what we're used to doing. And I hope that the listeners have at some point felt in their body kind of where their intuitive center is, because I think that we all have a little bit of a different one, honestly. Mm. I think some people feel it deep in their gut. I think some people feel it in their womb space. I think some people feel it in their heart. Some people do feel it in their brain, but not their mental mind, just that incredibly energetic center. But it's the knowing is never from a thought. It's never let me calculate this. Let me manipulate that. Let me see where this can fit. It's it's a it's a clear answer. Mm. And sometimes that clear answer is not the one you want at all. <laughs> I can think of so many times where I tried to like negotiate with God being like, but, but, but. But if I leave you four marigolds at the altar. Yes, yes, please. <laughs> I'll meditate every morning, please. But no, it, it doesn't work like that. So that mm. is a hard fucking slap of reality. But I have found that the life that I have right now in this moment, in this room with the best friends I could have ever, 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 ever prayed for, I would have never been here if I didn't let the wave take me. Mm. And I got to the point when I was in like my death spiral of life that I didn't even have any energy to fight. Like I went through a divorce, then I got a stalker, then my house filled with mold, then my second house filled up with mold. Then like, I didn't know where I was gonna live. Like it was one thing after the next. And in the beginning I was fighting a little bit. And then once we got to like month three, I was like, okay, just take me. Where do I have to go? Like, I don't have the energy to fight anymore. And I think some people feel that. I know some people feel that where it feels like you're almost in a washing machine. Just getting fucking spiraled around and you don't realize that like you have a hand that can open the top of the washing machine and mm. stick your head out and be like, okay, we're in it right now. This is a lot. This is a lot, but it's going to turn off. This will turn off at some point. So 
I just yeah. want to throw that out there. Yeah. And sometimes when I've been knocked with one thing after the other, after the other, that's like the only way I'll actually surrender. Exactly. I mean, you and I are both strong personas, strong personalities. And it's like, I really do believe that life has this higher intelligence that knows what we need when we need it. And that mm-hmm. is really annoying to hear when it you is. are in the muck. So yeah. sorry, those of you listening who are in the muck, but um, yeah. Because there were times in my life, like in postpartum, after having the birth I had, uh, that I couldn't hear that. And that's okay. There's sometimes you just like need to shelf certain philosophies and pick it back up later. Be like, oh, yeah. Yeah. There was a lot to surrender to there. Yes. <laughs> yes. Life does that. It yeah. can feel like drowning many yeah. a times. I've drowned so many times. Yeah. It will happen again. Yeah. It will keep on happening. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's part of life's natural cycles. Like, Life does that thing over and over again, like the birth, growth, decay, death cycle Mm -hmm. over and over and over again, even within your one lifespan. It's like, why do we think we're above that? Mm -hmm. Why do we think like making ourselves look 20 years younger is like going to not make that cycle happen? Like, it's just (laughs) like, it's happening all the time, every day. And the practice of acceptance of allowing those different masks to fall away, allowing the body to age makes it so much easier. So you're yeah. not like kicking and screaming through the whole natural process. Heard that, sis. But in general, I mean, no one even likes to talk about death. Yeah. At all. Yeah. And no one likes to, and I mean, I'm not excluding myself from this. I'm very much a human on this planet. It's arguable, but uh, you know, we don't like the death phase. Yeah. The death phase is terrible because you have to grieve. No one wants to grieve. Mm-hmm. And in that grief then creates a pocket of space for what you actually are inviting in. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's where kind of the golden nugget is Mm -hmm. that you do have to let something die to have that availability and energy and also even in just your life. But that, that means you have to let the part of yourself die. That was so attached to that being your identity Mm -hmm. as well, which easier said than done. Uh, Like I'm not a doctor. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I am, I'm not a doctor. (laughs) Yeah. 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 I always like the idea that grief is just like your heart breaking open. Mm. You know, I really do. Like, I think that's Ram Dass's concept of grief. And when you're feeling grief because the heart is so heavy and sometimes you can't eat and sometimes you can't sleep, like um, that feels very far away. But every time I look back at like friendships I've grieved, the ideal birth I wanted, I grieved. Like all of those moments of intense grief really taught me a deeper capacity to love. Mm. Yeah, Yeah. I agree. I do agree with that. And it's also allowing yourself to be loved in those moments because you, you, you don't have any love to give when you're grieving. You are just holding on for hope that you will see the light of day again. Yeah. So allowing yourself to be loved by friends, like I mentioned in the beginning and you know, dogs, everyone knows I love dogs or even just allowing yourself to be loved by the earth, laying down next to a waterfall, sitting with the sun on your face. Yeah. Like smelling a flower. Mm. They can really change your day. Yes. <laughs> Shout outs to the entire Reunified community that brought me food during postpartum. Mm. Like, I think I didn't cook for a month or something. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. It was really special. And that was an, a perfect example of how community holds us. Yeah. Held me. But so many people don't even allow themselves to be held, right? Yeah. Because one of my first lessons that I learned when I did ayahuasca was I did not intend to learn this lesson. Went down to Peru, was just in this beautiful maloca, <laughs> the bunch of indigenous, incredible healers. And I take ayahuasca the first night and I told the shaman, I'm like, hey, this liver, she metabolizes slow. So I don't need a lot to blast off. And I'm like a hundred pounds. So please don't blast me off. I take like an eighth of what everyone else takes. Needless to say, it was, Wow. Like shitting herself immediately. Yeah, I didn't. I, so most people are vomiting. Yeah. I had to shit. That's so funny that you actually say that because most people like you're, you're going to purge one direction. I had to shit. If anyone has been on ayahuasca, you don't have a body anymore. You've left the body. I'm like, this body has to poop. I, I honestly was not planning on sharing that part of the story, but you said it. So like, we're in, we are in, carrying me we to the are in exactly. And I'm like, I have to shit. Yeah, so I there. get up to stand up. Legs give out, fall. I'm like crawling now <laughs> to the bathroom. Faint on like a beautiful man. Sorry, sir. Did not mean to wake up on you. And then, you know, someone had to physically help me to the bathroom. They had to help me with everything and they had to guide me back. And I remember in that moment, one of the, they were called like the angels, you know, like they weren't 
using plant medicine, they were just staying on the earth to help people do things like walk and drink water. And he said to me, and he looked at me and he goes, Ashley, it's okay to ask for help. Mm. And that like took me then on such a deep spiral to all the times in my life where uh, I needed help and I didn't ask for it. So then I now hold anger and resentment towards people in my life. But that was, that was me being a victim, right? That was me saying like, how could you not help me? Mm. And I've even had that lesson come up for me because again, these lessons happen in spirals and it's happened to me. That was decades ago at this point, but it's come up in more recently. And people have looked at me, hard stares at me like, well, did you ask? And I'm like, fuck, no, I didn't. So it's yeah. really hard yeah. to do that. And it's a lesson that I'm truly continuing to do. But when you ask for help, the people that love you want to help you through yeah. those dark times. But yeah. it's almost like this feeling of if they see me like this, Will they not love me? Or if they see me mm. like this, will they think differently of me? Or even just being, you know, like a doctor, if they see me like this, will they still see me as a healer? Like yeah. whatever bullshit that my silly human ego mind mm. wants to tell me. <sighs> yeah, I didn't shit myself. I did not shit myself. I made it to the bathroom. <laughs> I did. And isn't it funny that most people that make a, a living or their profession or their calling is to help others, like are the ones who like have a hard time asking for help. Yeah. I see that so much. I see that in myself. I see that in a lot of other teachers and healers. And it's like, yes, the reflection is so clear. Like mm -hmm. all the connections are right there. Like you can look at people's dharmas and their professions and like really understand about some of their, you can understand something about their deeper energetics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Even when I just got in that car accident, I totaled my car and I was just standing in Arkansas by myself in one of the worst neighborhoods I've ever been in. And I was like, why is no one fucking showing up for me? Why is no one showing up for me? I was resentful to my parents. I was resentful to my friends. Like I was like, how could no one show up for me? And then I had actually my partner now, he's like, well, you didn't ask. People wanted to, and you said no. And it slapped me over the face. And I was like, oh, I'm <sighs> doing it again. I'm self-sabotaging again. Yeah, but you ultimately received your now partner's help and that's how you ended up finding your now partner. Yes, yes, so, I did. Um, yeah. But I was like, how could people make me fucking drive after that? Like I had to drive mm -hmm. from Arkansas to New York, but yes, I did. So, you know, I did receive the help I did. Eventually. But um, yeah. it's really hard for me still on a daily basis, even asking for help. Like I need help feeding myself today. I need help walking the dogs today. I'm like, oh, I could do it. Yeah. I'll sacrifice myself to do it. Yeah. But when really we could just lean on yeah. your love that surrounds us. Again, like this is pointing to like, look at what feels hard in your life and like, what is it showing you? Mm -hmm. Like what feels difficult? What feels hard? What feels like an obstacle? Is it showing you that you need to ask for help? Is it mm -hmm. showing you that you need to organize your schedule? Is it showing you ne you need to put more willpower and effort in here? Like usually the hardships or the difficulties are, there's something there. Mm -hmm. There's something there that you're just like, no, not going to look at that. Not going to look at that. You know? Yeah. Then you're in a yin forward fold and you look at it all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so true. And I think it's a common thread amongst us and us humans. And it's a really beautiful one. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I, I think about <laughs> such a Scorpio sun, Scorpio rising, but sometimes I think about like the collective suffering that is humanity. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Scorpio. And I shed like a beautiful tear. I'm just yeah. like, damn, we are all in this. We are in it. And I like will have like a genuine cry sesh for like the suffering that is. And I think if we all lead into that, there would be more healing happening. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of saying, oh, no, that's not my suffering. No. Yeah. yeah. Good. How are you doing? Good. Yeah. Good. 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 You know what we say and how we, <laughs> what we say over and over again and how we move our bodies, like it's, it informs, it informs our life. And so if someone says, how are you? And your knee jerk reaction is always good, no matter what, like there is question your honesty. Like, how are you honest with yourself? Sure. Are you honest with others? Like I catch myself in those robotic patterns too, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's healing in every little thing that we do, yes. every action we take, everything that we say. And so it's so important, I think, to break free from the mold and broke, break free from like reactive behaviors or um, common phrases and drop in and say, do I really mean that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Words hold immense weight and, you know, 
I'm not a hippie in the sense that I'm like, words are all spells. But <laughs> I don't think that fully. But I do think that when you create an authentic space for someone, when you answer, you know, that's actually one of my favorite things. When I ask someone how they are and they're like, I'm going through it. Or how are you? And, you know, I'm actually doing fucking terrible today. And I'm like, I hear you. Thank you for being honest. Like, please open that space. And I, when I, even being a yoga teacher, you know, you were on stage. You are standing in front of a room. People are staring at you. And for some people, they love that. Some people, they hate that. Obviously, I love it. But there's some days where I would show up to teach where even Monday, this Monday, I cried before I taught. <laughs> Not in front of the class. <laughs> I told them I cried before though. I cried because I was doing way too much and I needed a yoga class and I felt like a little fucking baby. And I cried, I'm like, ah, meow, meow, meow. And it's because I didn't take care of myself and I showed up to class and that was my intention. I was like, hey fam, this is what I'm going through. Like I cried before I came here because I am not taking care of myself the way that I should. This is how it's showing up in my life. This is what I'm learning from it. And it's always the days where I am my pure unfiltered self. And some days my pure unfiltered self is me being really bubbly and really happy. I would say most of the time it is, but a lot of the times it's not. And definitely when I was going through that dark night of the soul, I was not always like that. And in me being my full self, the connections that I've made with students because of that, I think that's also why my classes are, you know, the same students keep coming back because they connect with my heart and they connect with my authenticity versus this mask of what would a yoga teacher be when they stand in front of the class? What would a yoga teacher wear? What would a yoga teacher say? What would their voice sound like? Mm. And I'm sure you know that the yoga voice cannot do the yoga voice. This is my voice. This is how I teach yoga. Um, I will laugh. I will cry with my students any day, but you're also incredible at that. Mm at showing up and because of that, the students can do that. Yeah, I do. I do think vulnerability is connection. Mm -hmm. It's just like one less mask you're wearing, yeah. right? Um, when we talk about the basic philosophies of yoga, it's like you and I are one. You and I are reflections of one another. And the more masks we wear, the more layers we have on, the more separated we feel from that truth. And so to actually share what you're feeling, which sounds ridiculous to say that out loud, like yeah. why wouldn't you? But it's just not a part of our culture. No. To actually share what you're feeling is one step closer to that like uh, spaciousness, that beingness within us. Of course, that emotion is coming and going like everything else. So it's not who you really are, but at least it's one step closer. Mm -hmm. You're not wearing some, yeah, I'm perfect and everything's fine mask. Yeah. You know? But I love that you said that and that even made me feel the need to share that we, I think some people do associate with their emotions. I did for a very long time. Mm. Like, especially when I was depressed, I'm like, oh fuck. This is me now. This is me. You're just this emo bitch, you can't smile. <laughs> Nothing makes you happy. This is who you are now. Yeah. And it's so important to recognize and understand that like you said, emotions are energy in motion. And if you feel them when they come up, they will leave. Yeah. But if you do not, they stay. And then your mind will confuse that with your identity. Mm -hmm. And then it, and then it becomes a part of your story. Mm -hmm. And then you carry that forward, mm -hmm. which is just such a disservice. Yeah. And then your life reflects it. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you, it becomes part of your story, you carry it forward. And then everything around you, every person, every character reflects it. Mm -hmm. So sad. We're meant to be constantly shifting, constantly changing, moving the way um, that nature does. Mm -hmm. And it's usually in a way that you would have never imagined yeah. that you move. Yeah. Like, did you ever think that this would be you? My, my Chicago and mother still can't digest it. She's like, if you ended up, I was either going to go to Boston college or UCSD. Yeah. So I, I went to California instead of Boston. Um, and she always says like, if you went to Boston, would you still raise your son this way? If you went to Boston, <laughs> would you cut his natural mullet? <laughs> Sorry, mom. I know you're watching this, oh, but, um, we love you, uh, yeah, I don't think I would be this way. Yeah. No, if I didn't ride the wave, if I didn't let, of course I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't be this way. I would have been a plastic surgeon in Miami. Ooh. That's what my vision of myself Ooh. was. I know. And honestly, that doesn't sound bad. I no. mean, I know it doesn't support like all the great causes that you support. Yeah, it's but okay. It sounds like a fabulous life. Oh, I think it would have been really fun. Yeah. I just would have been very different. I would have looked like this. <laughs> like the filter you always wear. Is I that you? Filter. You're like channeling That's me. that version of yourself. Yeah. So many people think I look really pretty like that. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> People would like send that on the DMs. Yeah. Being like, you look gorgeous. What did you do? And I'm like, this is a fucking filter. Okay. Like, oh my God. I like literally, wow. Different perspectives of beauty. Interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. The funny thing is, no matter how we would have ended up, like whatever version of ourselves, like I firmly believe like that was the version that was meant to be. And it's yeah. like all this, this dance of life and, and the Sanskrit word for it is Leela. It's all this like play of life and I mean, like, can we embody this attitude of acceptance, knowing that you're like, you're playing, doing the play that you're supposed to play. Same for me over here and allowing for the plastic surgeon in Miami to do the same. Yeah. Don't hate it. Yeah. I mean, because how can we even, you know, how can we find acceptance and surrender and settle into self if, if we're not accepting of others? Oh, for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. And I mean. A filter and a no, or no filter. Yeah, filter and no filter. <laughs> I mean, we live in a day and age in which many are not accepting of others, right? Yeah. So that's, I think collectively this beautiful planet is is going through it, you know, yeah. to learn a lot of the things that we are actively learning and discussing on this podcast, but we are, we're all reflections of each other, like you've said over and over again. And if you can't find the beauty in someone else, it's going to be almost impossible for you to find it in yourself. And I don't know why I'm blanking on the author's name, do you remember the author same who wrote Many Lives, Many Masters? Uh, I can't think of it right now. He's amazing for those of you listening that want to just cry. <laughs> <laughs> Many Lives, Many Masters is amazing. And he wrote, I think in one of the last chapters, and this visualization has stayed with me ever since I read the book, that inside of every human is a diamond. And it sits along behind our heart, behind our sternum. And it is this gorgeous, complex diamond, you know, that has all these different chromatic colors and patterns. And it's gorgeous. It's undeniably gorgeous. But inside of everyone, there's a different degree of cloud over that diamond. And a lot of that cloud is self-perception self and also ways in which you view the world. And until you clean off your diamond, you will not recognize how beautiful you are or how beautiful everyone else is. And that has stuck with me. And I think that even living in a city where there's homeless people everywhere and there's people that are, you know, going through their process. There are people that have been, that just moved here. There are people that have been, you know, on this path of yoga. It doesn't, there's people that are unbelievably rich here. There are people that are struggling to survive here. And if you can't see the beauty in everyone's story and in everyone's struggle, it's going to be a miserable place to live. It's going to be a miserable fucking planet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise there's just more and more polarity, more and more separation, which, mm -hmm. which is the, the root of all conflict. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Damn. Love all the jewel metaphors. That's very like, it's in, even in the sutras, um, I believe it's like the intellect or the mind is a jewel and the more you polish it, mm. the more you see the reflection of self yes. in all things, all objects, all beings. I love jewels. Jewels are nice. I love them. Yeah. I love shiny jewels. Yeah, you're covered in jewels. I am covered in jewels. Yeah. Not enough, but yeah. I'll get some more jewels. Nudge, nudge, Nick. Yeah, nudge, nudge. <laughs> <I'm so laughs> JK, you can buy your own jewels. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I will. Yeah. We'll see. John got me this one. Oh, shout out. <laughs> shout out, John. 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 We, we love you. If you haven't watched the episode, Bonnies <laughs> and Buttholes. <laughs> Bonnies really, and Buttholes. A little, a little uh, sexier and more lighthearted than this one. <laughs> yeah, a little a little. If you're sexier. going through it in life, this is the one. Maybe Bond on Buttholes for later. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, number one episode. What can we say? Yeah. People love the butt. Yeah, people do love the butt. Yeah. <laughs> people love butt stuff. Yeah. Or actually, no, I think people just feel some kind of way about butt stuff. They do. Well, well, so like, now we'll take this. <laughs> now we'll carry this. So, so they're going to watch it no matter what, because either they want to like internet troll you and be like, no, butt stuff. Or they're going to be like, yes, I want to know more. Other people who like butt stuff. Yeah. <laughs> You're so fucking right. You are fucking right. Because now that I'm like out and about in the social media world, like I don't think any of you understand how resistant I was to be in the social media world. I did not want Instagram until my friends from home in New York were like, let me send you dog memes. And I was like, okay, that got me. You can send me dog memes. <laughs> I don't want to be in the social media world, says the Leo who likes to be on stage. But something that I've noticed is that the more and more people that learn about you, the more and more people that are drawn to you, but it will be one of the two. They're either full supporters or they fucking hate you and want to destroy you. And there's no in between. Oh, I've, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
I know. And that was very hard for the people pleasing part of me. Yeah. I was like, oh, like creating a business that is a community means there's going to be people who hate me and don't agree with the way I do things. Yeah. And I let, that was very difficult for me, but getting better at it yeah. with each, with each hater. Yeah. <laughs> there comes, uh, ideally not a thicker and thicker skin, which is like my, I think first Chicago response. I'm like, yeah. thick in my skin. I don't yeah. care. Yeah. But I think <laughs> ideally it's more just like, oh yeah, I'm being a full expression of like what I need to be um, in this lifetime. And that isn't going to jive with everyone. I think that it's almost as if when you are more authentic, it's as if your vibration, your frequency gets more clear. Mm. So it almost will be this powerful force to either guide your people towards you. Like you will find your soul fam mm. when you are yourself. Mm. You didn't want to be friends with me when I was not my whole self. Like, <laughs> honestly, like you weren't drawn to me, right? Like, I don't know. I wasn't, I was like, do you remember me when we first started working together? Like I wasn't myself. I wasn't loud. I wasn't outgoing. Mm-hmm. I wasn't confident. Mm-hmm. I would just sit in the lobby and watch everyone talk. I would never make a joke, uh, you know, and I'm, Fucking hilarious. So that is sad that I held in all my jokes. For- yeah, you didn't even make jokes while you were teaching. No, back then. I know. I was yeah. so different. Yeah. And now that I am my true self and a lot of, you know, that that process of me fully dying showed me who I was underneath it. My people found me and I could talk about that, whether I'm talking about my friends, whether I'm talking about my partner, whether I'm talking about my business, like, and my patience. And your health. And my health. Isn't like, that crazy? Like, the yeah. more and more you show up to who you are, like, your health also is in alignment with that. Yeah. Uh, people forget that it's like, oh yeah, that inner process, that inner journey is directly impacting impacting the outer body and the mm-hmm. choices we make, you know? Drawing the people in, but at the same time that's doing that, I think it almost serves as this trigger for the people that should not be in alignment. So they get like a solid universal push. Mm. And sometimes that push is painful, mm. but I think that that's also then the victim mentality, right? Being like, oh, how could they hate me? Love me. Love me, please. please. But like, please. <laughs> Love me right or don't love me at all. So goodbye. Mm. Mm. The authentic way. Oh, the authentic way. Not always the easy way, but I, I say it's an important way to live. I say so as well. Yeah. I really do. Hmm. Well, my girl, this has been a lovely little conversation mm. on our lives and what we've learned. And as you may or may not know, at the end of every episode, I always give you the stage to see, which you've been on the stage the whole time, but you get even more of the stage. <laughs> if there is a love bomb that you want to give to someone or something, if there's a truth bomb that you want to share, a knowledge bomb, anything at all that is on the surface of your heart, this is your chance. Okay. I guess I just want to say if any of the listeners are going through a really difficult time, um, I feel you. And my whole first year postpartum was probably the most intense uh, emotional battle. I don't know if that's the right word that I've ever experienced, more of an inner battle than an outer battle. And uh, I can look back and say, I feel humbled. I feel a deeper capacity to love myself and others. And I'm so grateful that I went through that hardship. So whatever it is that you're experiencing, know that there's... um, light on the other side it's just the natural way of things and that you don't have to know right now but at some point you might be able to look back and be like oh i learned this so i think that's what i would want to say thank you gorgeous and i know that there's a lot of moms that needed that specific message today and you know i've never given birth but that is an unbelievable process of death and rebirth So I can imagine that a lot of what we chatted about today was very real. And I mean, I know it was because I was with you during that journey. So I really do appreciate you sharing that. Um, And as you also mentioned, you know, it's not easy when you're going through it at all, at all. And I do think that it's going to be a trigger for some people to hear like, it'll get better. You will learn something from this. But honestly, fam, you're going to. So if you are in that dark place, know that there are people in your life that want to love you. They want to love you. They really do. And they're just waiting for you to ask for them to be something that you can lean on, something that can remind you that you will get through it. And also just sit with you and remind you that it's fucking hard and that it will pass. So if you needed to hear that today, I hope that this episode brought you just some ease to your nervous system and trust that you are evolving into a version of yourself that will align you with the life that you've always wanted. And 
you know, I can say this today and maybe next week I'll be crying in here and throwing glass against the wall. And we'll talk about that as well. Okay. Because I am learning every single day with all of you. Same. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> we are humans mm-hmm. in these flesh suits. And truly, I'm so grateful for the woman that you are and all that you have taught me and all the space that you've held for me. And I fucking love you. Mm, thanks, sis. I love you too. Mm. And I love all of you for listening. Thanks for being here. And we will see you soon. Don't smash anything glass. But if you do, say smashly. I'm in it. I'm in it. I'm in it. <laughs> <laughs>